Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Los Angeles Asian Pacific Film Festival produced by Visual Communications. My name is Lindy Liang. I'm one of the senior programmers at the festival. I am zooming in from Silver Lake, Los Angeles on the native lands of the Tongva, Chumash, and Tish people. Uh, if you would like to read closed captions, uh, we'll be dropping a link in the chat soon. Click on that and it will bring up a new window that will open with the audio transcript. We would like to thank everyone for making this festival possible today, um, especially the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences, Sony Picture Entertainment, Comcast, NBC Universal, the California Arts Council, SAG AFRA, Producers Industry Advancement and Cooperative Fund, the National Endowment for the Arts, and HBO and Warner Media. And thank you to all of our community partner organization for the valuable work and for continuing to support visual communications. Special thanks to our friends at the Chinese American Museum, our um, co-presenter for today's event. Today's conversation is Far East, Deep South, Race, Immigration, and Empowering the Future. Our panel will talk about the film Far East, Deep South and discuss family separation, remembering your elders, and the often forgotten history of Asian Americans in the United States. Let's meet our guests. Um, I'm going to invite all of our guests to turn on their cameras right now. Please welcome director Larissa Lam, producer and subject of the film, Baldwin Chu, Ted Gong, who's the founder director of the 1882 Project Foundation, a nonprofit organization that broadens public understanding of the history of Chinese in America. And last but not least, to moderate our conversation, please welcome business executive and author of Finding Samuel Lowell, China, Jamaica, Harlem, Paula Madison. Enjoy the program. Thank you, Lindy. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our uh, discussion, which I know is going to be lively because um, contrary to what you might believe, uh, Ted and Larissa and Baldwin, we all know each other really well. So this is going to be uh, really a chat among friends that you will be invited to join in on. And um, before we get started, it feels to me like this will be a really good time to start with a clip from the documentary. Uh, we're doing it right up front because we believe that there may be some of you who haven't seen it. And if you haven't seen it, um, this will only whet your appetite to really go watch it because it's an amazing documentary. So can we roll that? Growing up, it was always kind of a mystery about my dad and his side of the family. Whenever my brother and I would ask him about my grandfather, he would just say, oh, it's a sad story. It's, it's not a big deal. One day we came across this photo of a gravestone, and that's when my dad finally told us that this is where my grandfather and great-grandfather were buried, but not in China, in Mississippi. Chinese people in Mississippi? What happened there? I actually don't know where we are going and where we're going. Last thing I thought I'd ever find in Mississippi was a Chinese museum. I guess there was more than just my grandfather and my great-grandfather. When the Chinese first came to the Delta, they were treated like we were. Everything was very segregated. I mean, it was black, white. We were just really in the middle. I had to attend a segregated one-room schoolhouse. Growing up, I read about segregation, and I, I thought that it only affected the black community. I just didn't really think that it happened to the Chinese, too. What? Great Grandpa! Oh my God! I knew all your family. It is so important for people to know what happened with the Chinese Exclusion Act and how it affected Chinese Americans throughout the nation, including the South. Wow. 
Okay, so uh, Larissa and Baldwin, um, I'm not sure if the folks know that you guys are actually married. So oh, that's, that's, that's always, good to bring up. So. That's always a good thing to remind people. So we we've been quarantining together. So closely together. I know. So yeah. comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've had a few years to do that. <laughs> let's let's start with why you, why you made this film. What was it and why did you make it and why now? Well, I mean, the film actually started off as just our private personal family journey to discover more about our family. When we, when we finally heard and talked to my dad that um, our family had roots in, in Mississippi. And uh, we really went to go visit a gravesite. <laughs> yeah. And I thought, I literally thought, I grew up in California. I'm an LA girl. I grew up in, in Diamond Bar. And I literally thought I'd find two Chinese men, his grandfather and great grandfather, buried in Mississippi and lo and behold we discovered there was generations of people that had lived there um, and that were so significant to the contributions in that area and I was like how come we don't learn about this in our history books and of course there was the personal revelations that um, happened that were just amazing and then really though the significance of the fact that Growing up in California, we were just taught about maybe railroads and we're taught about the gold rush that the Chinese, you know, were a part of this country, but never were we learning about um, the Chinese being in the South and also impacted by segregation. And that's something we all learned in our history books is the story of the American South and segregation. And I just thought this is a bigger story that needs to be told, especially when people continue to look at people of Asian descent as perpetual foreigners that I was like, wow, we have a long legacy in this country, not just through his family, but also just through all the other families that were in the South. Yeah, and even just learning about the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, which I had no real idea about until right before uh, we set out our journey there. And then to see, um, you know, information about that, even in, in a museum in Mississippi about Chinese was amazing to me. And then you found out that it actually it impacted personally us. impacted your family. Right. Yeah, yeah. Ted, I want to bring you in on this. Uh, so Ted, you who are the uh, executive director of the 1882 Foundation. Um, what Baldwin just said, how, how often is it that we're finding Chinese Americans who really don't know much about this history of being targeted and, um, in a way that no other um, nationality has ever been targeted in the United States? You know, that's a really interesting question. When we started the 1882 project, which was to, it, it was done in starting 2009, 28, 29, in which we were trying to get congressional apology for the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. And in the process, of course, there's a huge grassroots education process. And it's amazing how many uh, people don't know, including our own, our own Chinese American community. Um, even more amazing is sometimes we find people that are historians that are American historians that don't pay attention to it at all or just barely know it's mentioned and so forth. Certainly when we approach senators and congressmen, they also are sort of in the dark. So I think that it's not uncommon to find people who just haven't, don't know the story. And that's not, not uh, it's understandable given sort of the way our history has been structured, the history taught in, in schools and the way our textbooks don't mention the entire history of America. And we get excluded out of that. And so as we grow up, then the Chinese Americans, Asian Americans just become invisible. Mm. So Baldwin, I'm, I'm curious. Um, you, you talked about having been in school and certainly, you know, you, you were there with your parents. Let's spend a moment talking about why there was so much of this that you weren't aware of in your own family. And then just about the history and legacy of Chinese Americans. And, and Larissa, I don't mean to, to cut you out of this, but what, I'm, <laughs> I really, what I really want to understand is that as we get to the, the fact that um, Baldwin's family has generations in this country and still there was so much that was not known. Why don't you guys talk about that? Yeah, I mean, first of all, like my, my dad, I think he might be listening in on this. I think I saw <laughs> his name in the panel. So hi dad, <laughs> hi mom. Uh, but I, I think part of it really was um, when he first came over here, I mean, they were going through a lot of hardships and for him to even go through the racism himself and his, he came back over with his grandmother, um, as you saw in the film. And I think the hardships really overtook um, 
the the ability to just want to tell and recall the past to share it with 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 us with me and my brother and so i think all those um all those things he was like i think he just didn't want to really delve it back you know bring it back up and share it with us and part of it was fear maybe part of it was uh bring back old which pains. is very typical with a lot of you know parents of that generation especially those you know who are asian um who come from um, another country that the immigrant experience was traumatic enough and and the hardships to make it here that they're like oh we don't want to burden our kids with that yeah and i think he also thought that um you know, maybe we wouldn't care, you know, we're, we're finally the Americans. So let's just not deal with all the stuff in the past that could, that could hinder your Americanness, maybe. And so he just didn't think it was something um, that we would care about or think that it was applicable to our lives. But in fact, it would have helped so much more for me and my brother, I think, if we actually knew this history, we would have responded so much differently with when, when racial slurs or racial uh, insinuendos or comments were made when we were growing up. We can actually probably have a more intelligent conversation uh, at, that, at that high school level you know, with, with other friends and students if we actually knew this history rather than try to laugh off a racist joke. Well, and, and I would just interject that. I think part of, part of it too is that your dad just didn't know, which is why we made a movie because that we ended up discovering a lot and he was discovering it you know as, as you see in the film with us and and he didn't know about the exclusion act either and the impact he didn't know that was a major reason why his family was separated and i think that right. has changed maybe his perception like he thought maybe it was his father's fault that he didn't come back to china or that he couldn't come to the u.s and and, and now he realized forces beyond his control you know really is what kept their family apart you know if i could just interject quickly and in this is not only just sort of like maybe uh, not from remembering or not wanting to tell people uh, for whatever personal reasons, but legally, uh, I mean, you look at the fact that you're looking at a family, you're looking at a family too that says law and that you're actually two, All right? So what is that? That's paper son situation. And what does that mean is that the Exclusion Act uh, excluded Chinese by race, excluded Chinese from becoming American national by race. And so a lot of people that came in use borrowed identities and so forth. And if they talked about it, if they mentioned it, then that subjects them to possible, uh, possible uh, deportations or, or this sort of stuff. So the idea is not to talk about it and not necessarily even to your own. So at a certain point, your sons and then your grandsons uh, don't realize it because if you mention it, there's a, the, the fear is for those people that actually uh, came in under false names, you could be deported. It's quite quite serious. Even in the time of the confession programs where they're trying to regularize all the immigrations and so forth, a lot, it pit a lot of families against each other as one person, you're ratting us out. So it's a, it's a very difficult thing, not just in terms of the emotional, psychological, which is there too, but in the legal sense, it's a, it's a fear. You know, the, yeah. the, go ahead, Baldwin. Yeah, I was gonna say, yeah, even even though um, our family was not that we were not paper, you know, we were not a paper family, that those fears that, that Ted mentioned are still there, simply because, you know, the, the rest of America doesn't know that, oh, they just misspelled our name, they mixed up, they messed up our first name with our last name, and they couldn't tell the difference, but you still have a different last name. So maybe you're not here legally. And so those fears, I'm sure are certainly there for for many uh, Chinese Americans that that were under the same situation. There's oh, we a, know some families that are still like, yeah. afraid to, to tell the real names. Yeah, and a lot of the families uh, that were in the South that we met that you know they, they still have their papered names or, or they have their their first names that are last names now. I uh, I was at a board meeting for the um, Chinese American Museum a few years ago, and and I have a, a young cousin. One of my young cousins was visiting from China, so I had him go through. The museum while I was there at this meeting, which was kind of brief. And when I caught up with him, he was sit standing outside with tears in his eyes. And I asked him why, and he said he'd never heard about the Chinese being persecuted in the United States. And this is a man who actually uh, it was a 37-year-old investment banker in Shenzhen, worldly, traveled, never knew anything about it. So, so if, if, if we, we broaden this to sort of a global experience, what we find out is that it's not just many of us who don't know, but an awful lot of the world doesn't know. And then let's address the, the, the whole concept of othering, you know, of being othered. Um, 
Baldwin, you mentioned that your dad was hoping that this meant that, you know, we're finally American. You know, we're, we're finally American. Maybe that's why he didn't want to burden you with what had gone on. But if we take a look at particularly what's happening today, heightened by what's happening in this era, uh, what does this film tell us about who is an American? What does your documentary um, um, open one's eyes to? Talk about that for a bit. Yeah, I mean, I, I hope people will see that um, immigration, Americanism is, is a complicated issue and that this country was really uh, formed with a lot of people that are not from America. And I think for, for me, you know, we were just really looking at my daughter. I mean, that was really the, the inspiration for the film was that my daughter was born and we didn't know at that time that she was multi-generational other than maybe second generation or third generation. But when we discovered that she was beyond like five, you know, and okay, it might be a spoiler, spoiler, alert. spoiler six, six, generation. You know, six generation, you know, uh, she, I mean, she, it made me think like, wow, she's been here for six, our family's been in this country for six generations, yet we're still trying to defend how American we are. I mean, we would learn about all the, the people, including my father, who served in the military, retired from the military, did everything they could just so they could be citizens in this country and, you know, died for this country, yet still not American. And so I really, we, I think, you know, when, when me and Larissa were talking about this, we really wanted to show that this is an American film, not a Chinese film or a Chinese American film, but we wanted people to firsthand realize that we are, we are American. And yeah, and I think what's disheartening, and we've seen it in you know in this pandemic um, where there have been anti-Asian you know racist uh, attacks, whether it's verbally or even physically. I mean, we had an incident even pre-pandemic with someone locally here. We live in Pasadena. It's a very multicultural, very progressive city, and yet we had somebody make a very racist comment to our family, and it was just like, what year is this, right? <laughs> and so you know, sadly, this is something we have to address. And our hope is that our daughter and all the other kids that are born after her will not have to deal with these questions of like, how American are you really American, you know? So Ted, you and I are the generation preceding them. Yeah, probably <laughs> preceding them by quite a bit. <laughs> we're, we're, we are older than we look and you guys look, you guys look very young, so. <laughs> I was just on, a, on another panel in which uh, the, the, we're talking about a, a, a political Chinese, uh, Chinese Americans running for political offices locally and they were 30 something and I was saying these are all these young people and everybody else who's in the audience like 30 or 20 <laughs> anybody <laughs> under 50 Paula is I'm, young with, I'm with you brother I'm with you anybody <laughs> be my child but, my child's 45 yeah um, but I, I you know you know Paula I know you're asking questions but I think uh, I'd like to bring you into the conversation, talk about uh, your, uh, your sort of uh, uh, multiracialism and so forth. And I think it speaks to the larger issue of what this film is about and what Baldwin is trying to say that America is not necessarily what we automatically think about. It's not owned by just white people from Northern Europe or something of this sort. But in fact, uh, people have been like your family's been in the Americas for how many generations? Yeah. And how many, how's Jamaica and African American affect you? All this, I think it's just amazing. Hakka people have been all over the world. And uh, we should talk a little bit about that embrace of multiculturalism, which is really part and parcel of being America, of being an American. Yeah, I, I, when, I, when I first met Baldwin and Larissa, I was so moved by the story because I traveled to China in order to find my family. And when, uh, when, they tra when you guys traveled to Mississippi, <laughs> it was like your brother said, Chinese, <laughs> what's going on here? But you know, what, what, what we knew is that um, wherever in the world there are people, you're going to find Chinese people. And in my case, you know, my grandfather left uh, Hong Kong. He was um, uh, our village is is in what is today uh, present day Shenzhen, but he left Hong Kong for Jamaica in 1905 when he was 15 years old, and 
that wasn't even the beginning of the Chinese going into the Caribbean. It really started like in the 1830s in Trinidad right. and places like that. So um, what's, what's fascinating here is that um, for me, the mixture of African diaspora and Chinese diaspora uh, it came about because of people being in love, right? What, what we see in your documentary is, you know, you guys go to, you know, this little burg in Mississippi and find black people and white people who are speaking of your grandfather and great grandfather fondly. I mean, they remember them. It's like, not only do we remember them, but here's pictures of them. Not only, <laughs> and here's the but, it's like, what? So <laughs> in, 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 in Ted, in what you were mentioning, you know, it, it's that my grandfather went to Jamaica as a young teen and became a man there and, and in, in reaching his adulthood, fell in love with a few African Jamaican women. <laughs> <laughs> he was a player, yeah. Player, player. yeah. It's okay, yeah, he left a lot, a lot of- player. I mean, you know, I get why they succumbed, I get it. <laughs> um, but going and then finding this, this family of, of 300 of my grandfather's direct descendants in, in China just made me know that the world is very, very, very small. Mm. It's a very small place, even with a nation the size of China, uh, you can run into people who literally are your cousins. And <laughs> how, how can you, what, how can you be my cousin? Well, you actually can be. It's a, uh, it's a story that I think, um, Ted, that I would say, is becoming increasingly popular because um, mixed race is the fastest growing demographic in the United States today. And, you know, thank God what we're seeing is love is love. It, it, love is love and people are going to fall in love. The more proximity, the, the okay. less polarization there is, right? The, the closer the proximity, proximity, the greater the chances are that it's, it's going to be a more, um, um, I'll say intimate relationship. <laughs> I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm stuck at the thought of just thinking that your, your grandfather was like this sexy Asian man that everyone desired, right? <laughs> so that totally, that busts all the stereotypes, right? Like all, all the stereotypes. <laughs> when I, when I worked over at NBC, I remember when I um, became the uh, chief diversity officer after running TV stations and stuff, I was in a room with the creatives and I said, you know, I think we're making some progress in, in how we are depicting African-Americans, but I'm not going to feel that we're truly successful until we have an Asian American man cast as a romantic lead. Oh, I think we're getting and the it. Whole room, they stared at me. They looked at me like, what is she talking <laughs> about? And I said, a romantic lead. I said, meaning like a sexy Asian, Asian American. I said, you know, the most populous nation on the planet. And they looked at me. I said, some Asian men, in fact, a whole lot of them know exactly what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we're really getting there. I mean, Baldwin, you're on your way, right? <laughs> oh, am I? <laughs> no, but you know, one of the. Do I have your things, vote, Ted? <laughs> oh. <I'll, I'll, laughs> Well, if it means anything, you remember I'm the group that's above the 60s. <laughs> but the, uh, I, I think one of the great things is not only the uh, Chinese diaspora, it's all over where you can find these connections, like uh, you searching your roots and winding up in China and Baldwin searching his roots and winding in Mississippi of all places. But Mississippi, you should, has, has such a huge history. And the area where you grew up, it's amazing how many shops and how many people and how much that interaction. I grew up in rural California in a small town and everyone knew everyone. So when we go down to your place, Baldwin, and we were walking around some of the fields and stuff, it seems so familiar to me. What, what is it like, Larissa, for you as, as actually the urban socialite, <laughs> <laughs> whatever, to go yeah, down and find too. out that, hey, my husband, 
has this whole background that is like chopping cotton in the fields. Of, yeah. Of well, he he didn't chop it, but his <laughs> and actually his great great his great grandfather didn't. But like the people that were the generations that were there. I mean, I think mm -hmm. I think for me it was interesting because you know, like I mentioned earlier, you know, I I didn't even care about history honestly, even though I took AP history and uh, you know did very well in history. But you know, I was like your typical. I was I did the work. I got the A on the essay, and and then I moved on. And and we talk to teachers nowadays that ha and other students where you know they have they might have Asian students in their class and they're like yeah you know they learn about segregation and slavery and they you know do the work but they don't really feel a connection and they kind of dismiss it afterwards and just go like yeah that's that's not our people and and now you know with our film and as they learn about their story or watch our film they're like oh my gosh there's actually a very strong connection to the the black experience in, in America that people just don't know about because all we Generally, I mean, I grew up in LA, so you know, all I know is you know the tension between you know Asian store owners and in, in the you know inner city, and 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 that hap that's the narrative that I was fed my whole life, and so um, to know that actually there was a very strong symbiotic relationship between the Black community and the Chinese community, uh, that was very very eye opening, yeah. and, and something that we hope more people will will get to know, and very moving, even especially on an emotional level to hear the stories. I think one of the things we really did not want our film to do was to have uh, people that look like us or white people talk about the relationship between blacks and Chinese. We really wanted to hear it first from the, the black community. And we were so grateful that that we found these people and that they were so willing to And share. I was actually, I was, I didn't know the history. So I was scared because I was like, oh gosh, they're going to they're <laughs> say like, oh, those Asians are coming over and taking over our neighborhoods. And in fact, again, this is early 1900s and 1800s. They were saying like, oh my gosh, like if we didn't have Chinese grocery stores there, like we'd have nowhere to shop or like, or if we, we didn't want to go, they wouldn't let us in the front door of the white stores. Because again, we take it for granted now today. I know we've got issues with racism and, and inequality today, but talking to all these you know old timers so to speak i mean it was bad you know <laughs> it was really bad in the south and, and and so i have a greater appreciation for that and even hearing them because i mean these, these people were in their 80s and 90s that we were speaking with right and they were talking about how even when they were kids they would hear stories from their parents um, about the chinese grocery store owners that means their parents actually cared enough about the Chinese that lived in the black community in order to share that story with them as they were growing up. Yeah. You know, my grandfather in Jamaica was a Chinese shopkeeper. Mm -hmm. So there they're, they're, they're called Chinese shop, right? So the, the Chinese shops are all over the island. And, and the comparison in terms of the relationships between the African community and the Chinese community is different because in this country, in the United States, we had laws, we had miscegenation laws um, dealing with n no race mixing. Mm -hmm. They didn't have that in Jamaica and much of the Caribbean. So what you had was very, very frequently the Chinese men were taking on, in effect, second families because their wives and children were back in China. Mm -hmm. They had the shop. And usually the African Jamaican woman was living in the shop with the shopkeeper in a husband wife relationship and the children were there. So you have a whole, um, in, in, in Jamaica and much of the Caribbean, it's a buffer class. There, there are the, the whites, the colonialists at the top, right? The, the British. And then you would have a mixture of Chinese and Syrian and Lebanese and Jewish, and then you had the Africans, but you would see interaction, uh, child bearing, living together, even marrying. Um, here, the communities lived very next to each other, but they still maintained separate social lives, right? Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. um, and what I find fascinating, and, and Ted, maybe you can weigh in on this, um, Talk a bit about the what it what it was that resulted in this series of laws being passed that cumulatively are the Chinese Exclusion Acts and why they ended in 1943. What why did they happen and why did they end? Uh, asking me or mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> the other Ted? <laughs> yeah, yeah, Ted. No, I, I, yeah. Well, you know. Uh, uh, it's a complicated story, but the, it, 
goes down to a couple of things, racism, economics, right? So Chinese were needed here to come in large numbers to help build things. The United States had the, had the mining that, that attracted people from all over the world. And then they had the railroad, which actually, Transcontinental Railroad, which actually the railroad companies actually sent people back to China to recruit for laborers that they couldn't, couldn't, they didn't have enough to build the railroad. So same story. You have people, we have an economic and industry that's growing, doesn't have enough workers or laborers. And so you start, you begin to rely on foreign workers, whether that's Chinese in this case, or the Irish at one point or Mexicans today. Uh, and then after you've used them and so forth, you decided, I don't want these people around and your economy is, uh, you use these other economic factors, you're taking away the jobs from uh, me or my white friends and so forth, and you kick them out. But the other part is just pure racism. You know, the, you don't look like me, you can't, you can't, Chinese can't become Americans because uh, they always, they always sort of pray to another god, they eat rats, they do all kinds of things of this sort. And then you create a, create these stories to allow you to then pass these anti-immigration laws. So those have been in the making for some time. In 1882, Congress passed those laws. One of the other factors is that uh, the 18, so typical, I don't know why in the current days, immigration debate, there isn't more of an immediate immediate use of, China, of the literature or the history of the Chinese immigration laws. So in the 1880, 1880 election and before that, very, very tight elections. So at that time, the South is defeated and the Democrat, the, the Democratic, that is the sort of the white supremacist Democratic position was coming up and the radical Republicans were the liberal part, the Lincoln's Republican, right? The elections were so tight every electoral vote count. And to the extent where uh, some of the, you know, you were like 50, 50 Democrats, 50, 50 Republicans. And so in order to get every electoral vote and every vote you can, they started appeal, uh, appealing toward anti-Chinese sentiment, which is primarily a Western phenomenon. And that escalated uh, into more and more uh, anti-Chinese sentiments uh, the radical Republicans, which were the Lincoln's party, used to not care. Uh, they thought about, thought about the uh, equal rights and uh, so forth, but, uh, and that uh, Chinese should not be given an eye to vote. But they used that in order to get pander for votes. And that resulted eventually in the passage of the 1882, of the 1882 Act. That stayed in the place until 1943. In 1943, we were in World War II and China was an ally of the United States. You can't, you can't really fight the war to end all, the, win, the war for democracy and have a whole group of people and who are actually your allies uh, be, uh, uh, be prohibited from coming to the United States. So you had to, Roosevelt had to rescind those laws and that's what they did in 1943. When they well, did thank that- God. Thank God there's no more anti-Chinese sentiment now. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. But, right. Uh, you know, I, uh, I don't know if it's worthwhile or you have time, but there's one cartoon, one uh, slide I have. And you know, I don't know if Francis can show that. It's quite I interesting. It's a, it's a political cartoon that was made in, um, in 1881, 1882. I think I Ryan know. has Ryan it. Ryan yeah. has it. Which one oh, is it? Ryan, it's a political cartoon. Uh, let me see this one here. Oh, okay. uh, this was uh, uh, the uh, I don't I don't know how you can all see this, but the whole we point was well. the main the main point here. All these people that are beating up on the Chinese are Democrats, Republicans, Independents, readjusters, everybody, because uh, and the the caption is give it to him. He's got no vote nor no friends. And uh, these are some, and uh, this is some of the 47th Congress, 1881, President Chester, or Garfield, the Senate and House, about 50, almost 50% the second time. The 1870 census in which the proportion, apportionment was made uh, was the first time since the Civil War that counted black African Americans. And they undercounted the blacks by quite a bit, we, we think. And they undercounted them in Pennsylvania and New York. So a lot of the, uh, there were a lot more votes given to the South as well. Interestingly, 63,000 Chinese, according to their 
1870 census and 55 Chinese, Japanese, I don't know where it is. But here is an illustration of what happens. Uh, if you didn't take the census that we just passed and then the census is not used to count everyone when you, when you uh, apportion out seats, you're going to have problems because this is the Congress that passed the 1882, 1882 law. Anyway, get back to you guys. Yeah. So, um, go ahead, I'm sorry. Hmm. I was gonna ask, so, so, so Baldwin, when you, when you see all of that in, in the context of, of not only what's happening, but uh, Ted mentioned how the labor regarding mm, mining, not so much mining, but the really building of the railroads. Railroads. Right. You have a connection to that one too? Wow. It's like you're reading our minds. What a segue. <laughs> what a segue. Yeah, yeah. This is, we told a few people about yeah, this. Yeah, we haven't but really told it's, too this, many. this part that we're about to share is not in the film. Yeah, this is brand new stuff. Uh, maybe it's our trilogy movie. It's our sequel to the sequel. <laughs> um, so, you know, yeah, this film has been amazing. Far East South about my father's, uh, our journey with my father's side of the family. But recently we just discovered some papers that indicated that on my mom's side, my great grandfather worked on the, the Transcontinental Railroad as well. And he was out of Colorado and there was a Chinatown there as well. And what was even more amazing was that, you know, we found, we found documents that he was here legally and um, he actually had a lawyer that's white that was working with him. Uh, apparently he went back to China to get a wife because just like most Chinese people at, during that time in the 1900, early 1900s, uh, they had they had no women here, like you mentioned earlier, to, for them to marry. So they went back to China, and he couldn't get back in, even though he was legally able to get back in. And his lawyer was like, "Man, this is really messed up. I'm trying to get you in. You should be able to come in, but but they're not letting you." And so that's dun dun dun. That's our <laughs> that's our new current discovery. We don't we need to figure out more on that one. Yeah, I mean, without. I don't think I, I don't think you we emphasized enough the the legacy of your family in the United States. So let's let's just mention again that your daughter is the sixth generation of your family in this country, right? Right. Correct. Yes. Yep. So 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 you guys are more American American. I like to say <laughs> citizens of the United States, but I'll say American um, than a lot of European. Americans, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, pretty much. More than even more than president, the, our current president. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, that's that that that's the part that I think is is eye opening. Um, I think what's eye opening with that with that statement is that uh, it's not just my family, right? There's there's so many more in this country that there's probably a lot of. Chinese Americans in this country who do not know that they carry a, a lineage back six, maybe even seven And a lot of people, if you're talking to his dad, I mean, his dad was born in China and we've met so many people who were born overseas, but their, you know, again, father or grandfather or great grandfather worked in the US. And so there is, you know, you skip a few generations, you know, consecutive, consecutively being born in the country, but they were all here at some point. Yeah, and that's kind of a statement that um, the Chinese Exclusion Act um, worked. It did its job, right? You had so many Chinese here that were here already. Uh, they were brought here, right? They weren't, they, they didn't like swim all the way over and just like snuck here, right? They, you were know, they were brought here because they wanted their help. They wanted their labor to build America. Mm -hmm. And then the Chinese Exclusion Act happened as Ted was speaking about. And it, it worked. It was, it was to get rid of the Chinese after they brought them here. And that's why so many ended up going back and couldn't make it back or maybe some of them didn't want to come back because of all the stuff that was going on here. Yeah, I think I think I should offer up a bit of information for people who are trying to trace their family's history, right? Um, mm -hmm. One of the things that I found incredibly helpful is a website run by the Mormon church called familysearch.org. And I found yes. an immense amount of information uh, globally, because uh, as part of their religion, the Mormons, of which I am not one, but the Mormons, um, ha they trace legacy. So, so in our world, legacy books, uh, which uh, we pronounce Japu, I've heard them pronounce Supu, 
um, but we pronounce it Japu, the legacy books, um, the Mormons have the second largest collection of Japu in the world, the largest being in the Shanghai library. But I, I got the 5,000 year old um, series of Japu of my family, the Law family, turned it over about a month and a half ago to the Mormons who have this whole project they've started and they're starting it with my family. Um, they are uh, digitizing the entire 5,000 year legacy and they're translating to English, right? So this is one that for so many uh, of our Chinese families, uh, they don't know, they can't research, maybe they don't understand the language, but now they're being translated into English. And so this is what we'll start. So it's familysearch.org. I don't own any, <laughs> yeah. I have no stake in it or anything. It's, it's a free website and it's immensely helpful. Yeah, it actually, it actually helped us quite a bit too. We use them as long as, as well as Ancestry. And, you know, it was because of the information we found from Family Search that allowed us to get information from the National Archives in order to recover uh, the Chinese, exclusion, the Chinese files. exclusion files. That you'll see in our film, if you haven't seen our film, um, yeah. that are housed. We went to the one in San Francisco that housed Baldwin's family's um, mm -hmm. records. Yeah, another great source, if you're looking for genealogy, is, is something actually based in China and London. It's called My China Roots. Yep. Oh, yeah. It's designed, yeah. For, people, we, uh, it's designed we, for people who don't really speak Chinese, and they'll help you that way. Yeah. But one of the things I like to emphasize as we get near the closure, if I can, is that while we can trace all these roots back and find things uh, that are absolutely fascinating, I think one of the things fascinating about the story of going down to Mississippi which Bob went in and Larissa went in is the number of interconnections there are not just in terms of the social interactions between the local community, but there are some serious cases that came out of the Mississippi that people hardly know about. Before Brown versus Board of Education in one of the communities nearby Baldwin's grandfather was the case of Gong Lum versus Rice. Right. Which was yeah, that's, that was a very Chinese important. girl trying to get into a white school. And that case went all the way to the Supreme Court 30 years before Brown versus Board, the Supreme Court ruled against the integration, but it was still a, 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 a case worth mentioning about how much uh, Chinese actually were involved with the American uh, unfolding of American history. The other one to think about is uh, there was a big jazz band in the big time of big time jazz, which the head saxophonist was a Chinese girl from uh, a Chinese girl from uh, Again, not too far from where your your home in town is, hmm. and she was uh, part of this band that went uh, around the world. Was part of the USO tour, that uh, did things like Benny Goodman type stuff, and was involved. Wow. In so all Wait, that you know, know, are you talking about Guangzhou? That she's from somewhere around there? No, no, no. She was no, uh, from, the from, from the Mississippi Delta. Delta. Oh, down she was, with you guys. That yeah. that down south. That down south. south. The other south. <laughs> They're both south. The far east, <laughs> the down south. And so she was part of a, a all female jazz band, an all female big jazz band, uh, came out of Mississippi, toured the United States, toured the made the USO tour. Her name was Willie Mae Wong. <laughs> How can you get oh, more wow. south than that? But that's the international sweethearts of. Uh, jazz, I think. Sounds like a great so, movie coming up, right? It is. It is a fascinating movie scene. So you should write that. But <laughs> my point is that uh, we tend to think, if we do think about Chinese Americans, we tend to think about gold railroads, California, and that sort of stuff. But there's this whole world of Chinese all over the United States and doing uh, a lot of substantial, important things. And Baldwin's story is one of those. So let's talk about what's next for you guys. I mean, what's what's on the horizon? And I, I'm, I'm I know that um, this is just coming out, but you know, you guys are a creative pair. I'm sure your brains are churning, and you've got other projects going. So what's next? Well, first of all, I guess we're we're you know, since this is kicking off, I mean, we could announce that um, you know, education has always been our highest priority with this film. You know, first it started off as just a family journey, but Larissa made it very clear to me that, that we can't hold this to our family, that we need to change the education system. So uh, I guess we can announce that we signed with uh, an education distribution company, New Day Films. And um, 
I think Duke and Stan Stanford already uh, made first indications as soon as we made it public that they were going to add it to their collection. Yeah, and uh, I mean that is really our whole goal is we're aiming big. We're you know we didn't want to just make a, a film just for film festivals. We really wanted to make a film that would have a legacy and an impact where we would change the way U.S. history is taught to be more inclusive of, of the Asian American experience, especially in, in terms of when it, we're talking about segregation and uh, about the American South. And so you know we really um, hope that people will you know tell others about our film and, and engage schools and, and tell schools and teachers and professors about our film uh and you know we are we are we have been pitched a few other projects as well and so the next thing is obviously researching baldwin's mom's side of the family but um we also have a it's not an official official announcement yet but you guys um can be on the lookout possibly after you watch it at la asian film festival this this year and you you, you are amazed by the film hopefully <laughs> you'll want to tell your friends um but next year we may possibly be going on a national, a national broadcast, broadcast on TV. On TV. Um, oh. Yeah, and um, also right now, as we are talking, there's an award ceremony going on for a previous film festival we were a part of, Cinequest. Cine and they, because they just we were doing it us. here, we can't be at the, at the <laughs> award ceremony. And they just told us that we won the audience award for Cinequest for a documentary. So <laughs> oh, <laughs> you guys great. are the first to know. Yeah. They said it was okay for us to tell you, but you guys are the first to know. <laughs> Congratulations for that. Well, we have, we're going to take one question. We have a question from, uh, let's see, Patty Fong. Patty says, I am a first generation Chinese American. I know my father came to this country in the 40s as a paper son through LA Harbor. Any advice on how to start the research of my roots? Well, if, if uh, you want to go? Oh, go ahead. With uh, if if your is it you said father? Yes, uh -huh. father. In the forties, yeah. if the father did travel back and forth or have made at least one trip back to China, then there would have been if it's well, it's nineteen. It depends on what year. It if it was if before nineteen forty, it was before forty three. There are much better documents held because of the Chinese Exclusion Act. After forty three, becomes a little bit more. Difficult. difficult right you would need to either go through um what the, the couple of sites we mentioned whether it's family search um or ancestry um and here's the tip is you know with your father's name try every iteration of the name um because baldwin's last name is chu but we had to enter j-e-w j-u-e other different variations of his chinese name um it also the last name sometimes comes first um, I mean, it, it comes first when we pronounce it in Chinese, right? But then they yeah. don't know. So like Baldwin's, so, that's why it says Lou on the gravestone um, for those of you who've right. seen So when we, film. when we researched, we, we knew that my great grandfather's name was Chu Zhong Lu. So we had to look up every spelling of Lu that we Even could Even if it's of, a paper name, you still right? wanna do that. And then we also had to look up every spelling of Chu that could possibly happen. And we went to the family search and the ancestries to look up all those. We threw in, if you know the years that they're here, their census stuff, you can put age, you know, year dates on there, plus as many spelling narratives you had. Yeah. And then that'll get you some of the information. Um, I will say this, we uh, frequently do little webinars um, for, on, on the subject as well. And um, so if you're interested in finding more, you know, definitely for, or even if you just want to follow our film, you can subscribe to our newsletter at our website, fareastdeepsouth.com. We also have a podcast called Love, Discovery, and Dim Sum. And we did an episode um, previously about finding your roots that if you listen to, will hopefully give you more tips. But we plan to do actually a, another uh, we webinar in probably either at the end of this year or the beginning of next year in partnership with My China Roots, actually. Um, and so hopefully you can attend that and, and we can help you, you know, more specifically because um, we know it's difficult, it's difficult. <laughs> but we have lots of other tips. <laughs> and I'll give you a very quick first starter. If you, if you know the, the your name of the, the paper name is fine and you know the person came to LA Harbor or the immigration center that was there, go start your quest uh, at the U.S. Immigration Services the library librarian. They you go to their public site and they have a, li a librarian web that you can go to and ask them for records relating to whatever you know. They may be able to help you get started. And from there you can look at some of the records uh, that might take you to the records like the Library of Congress and the other things that uh, that are at the San Bruno and at the other National Archives. But start with the uh, 
uh, immigration department. Just look at the website, look for the immigration historian. Yeah, and also the National Archives, I think it's archives.gov. Um, they also have a searchable database that you can try to find information. That's great information. Okay, so we're gonna wind this down. We got the latest and newest from Larissa and Baldwin. Ted, you have anything new coming, happening that we should know about? Well, we are working on education programs too with the OCA, Asian American Advocates. We're doing something nationally to survey all the states to see what kind of programs they have, how can we improve, what are the best practices. Uh, we have um, our regular talk story series that's going on. And uh, we are going to try to restart our 1882 symposium that talks about what best practices are being done at uh, different museums and historical societies. I think one of the greatest things that's happening actually is Zoom. There's a lot of ability to use this process and this platform much more than we had thought before. It's not a limitation at all. It's a great enhancement to our, our mission. Excellent. And uh, I will say that my book, Finding Samuel Lowe, is in development as a six-part limited series that would air in China and here in the United States. So I'm going to... Hey, Paula, I want to audition for the sexy Asian man for your film. Then you'd have to be my grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> I'll play your grandfather if I get to be the sexy Asian man. I, I can write a theme song. For those of you who don't know, I, I'm actually a composer and a, a music artist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna turn into a hip hop musical. <laughs> all right, so so we'll, we'll, so I started out by saying we're all friends, and so we'll continue to be friends and and know that much more and work more closely together. Um, you can look for all to to the attendees. You can look for all of our contact information uh, probably in the chat, and uh, I'm going to turn it over to Lindy now for some closing remarks and how to wrap this up. And it was a pleasure. Uh, we got to do this again. Yes. And, uh, you know, this, this di these digital uh, friendships and chats are amazing because I'm not going to stand up to show you what I have on below, but I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. No, thank you. Thank you, Paula. Thank you, Ted. Thank you, uh, VC and, and everyone at LA Asian Pacific Film Festival and hope everyone will check out the film um, the next few days while it's still running here. It's an amazing film. Don't miss it. All of you who are on the site, make sure you see it and tell everybody to see it too. It's, it's you will cry. It's, it's very moving. Um, all right, Lindy, over to you. Hey folks, uh, that was such a wonderful discussion. Thank you to our special guest today. And thank you for joining us for this conversation. Please don't forget that this film is still viewable. Um, and if you haven't watched it yet, please go and do it so now. Uh, the viewing window does close this Saturday night at 11.59 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, if you enjoyed this conversation and our festival lineup, please consider donating to Visual Communications. This is our 50th year. Your support will help sustain our year-round operations and programming. You can do so by going to vcmedia.org for more information. Please be sure to join us tomorrow at 12 p.m. as we kick off the final day of uh, our C3 Converse Artist Conversations. We will have surprise performances for you. And please follow us on our uh, social media accounts at BC Film Festival. Don't forget to tag us with the uh, hashtag LAAPFF2020. Thank you very much for joining us today and we hope to see you again very soon. Thank you guys. Thank you to our special guests. Bye everyone. <laughs>